Welcome to WordWise, where we delve deeply in the Word of God, discover what it means, and how to apply it to our lives. Today we're continuing in Mark chapter 5, and we're studying verses 25 to 34. And last week, just to refresh your memory, we talked about Jairus and the idea that he had gone to Jesus with a severe problem, and Jesus had responded very quickly. And as they were walking to the house of Jairus, I refer to it as an interruption. Now, Jesus would not have referred to this situation that we're about to read as an interruption. For Jesus, people were not interruptions. In fact, they were more like divine appointments, divine appointments. And I think if the followers of Jesus, if we understood that, we would understand that sometimes God sets divine appointments in our day, and they're not interruptions for our to-do list or interruptions on our busy, busy path, but really they're opportunities to let God work through us. They're divine appointments. That's what Jesus does here in this setting today. And a woman, we don't even know her name, but yet she has a terrible situation and she goes to Jesus for help. And essentially, Jesus responds to her in a very interesting way. So read with us Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. So as we begin, try to focus on the story of this woman, her situation. Don't think about the end of the story. Think about her situation. For 12 years, she'd been struggling with a pretty severe health issue, uh, an issue of bleeding that would have, uh, the way the text reads in the context of this culture, it would have been an ongoing situation where she had regular bleeding that would have caused some very difficult problems, not just medically, but socially and religiously for her. Because of this issue of blood, she was not able to be in community with her fellow uh, countrymen and fellow townspeople. She would have been declared to be unclean. And that's not sinful. That's not the same thing. It's more of a ceremonial uh, unclean unclean status that she would have been uh, kind of asked to stay home, kind of self-isolate and kind of take care of herself and rest. She was not supposed to go to religious gatherings or social gatherings or even be out and about much. And normally that would have been an okay thing for a few days or or even a few weeks. Women after childbirth, it was a six-week recovery process where they were declared to be unclean so that they could rest and recover and not have any obligations. But in this woman's case, 12 years, 12 years where this bleeding would have caused physical and emotional struggles, but also the struggles that come with being constantly unclean, being isolated and socially and religiously cut off from her community. Think about that going on and on and on, not just for a few weeks or even a month, no, for 12 years. And Mark's pretty clear to give us the detail that she had spent all of her money on doctors and treatments to try to get better, but instead had only gotten worse. So as the years go by, she's getting worse and worse and worse. Think about that desperation, that that sadness, that isolation, that depression that would have set in from this condition. So she hears about Jesus. She knows his, his amazing abilities to work miracles. She may have heard about this in Capernaum, in the town where she's located here. And she may have heard from friends, neighbors, others who may have even received healings or knew of people that had healings. So she's thinking to herself, you know what? That may be my hope, maybe my last hope is to go to this Jesus and to receive a healing. But she's got some problems. She's not supposed to be out and about. She is unclean. She's not supposed to be out and about or in a crowd. And certainly, she's not supposed to approach a religious leader or a teacher or a rabbi. For the the rules were pretty clear. If you got close to a, a holy teacher or a rabbi or someone official at the synagogue, you would endanger them by touching them or coming near to them, making them unclean and unable to do their religious duties and responsibilities. So there was even a a rule against that. Don't even get close or or definitely don't touch a, a teacher, a leader. But what does she do? She's desperate for help. 
She's desperate. She needs to find a way to have hope. So she goes, despite those uh, barriers, she goes out, she goes in the crowd, she approaches Jesus and Jairus, by the way, a synagogue official and a great teacher, a rabbi, Jesus, and she's doing several things wrong by her culture's rules. She's pushing through those barriers because she's so desperate for help. And she's thinking to herself, if I can just touch his robe, if I can just touch his garment, that would have been a common belief in her day. If I can touch the robe of a holy person who does miracles, then maybe there'll be miracle working power that comes to me through their garment. And sure enough, that's what happens. Imagine the faith that it takes to overcome those barriers, to go out into the situation, to put yourself uh, violating the rules, essentially, and violating this, and just for the reality of touching his garment. And she does that. She touches his robe, and guess what? It works. The miracle happens. She immediately feels healing in her body. Imagine that moment. Put yourself in her place. After 12 years of suffering, she's healed. Instantly, she feels the healing in her body. And hope jumps for joy, and she is delighted and astounded with this miracle. She's overwhelmed, probably, with emotion and excitement and joy. And then she notices Jesus has stopped walking. She's noticed that he's looking around, and he's asking his disciples a question. And all of a sudden, that joy turns to dread, because she has been caught. She stole a miracle, essentially. She stole a miracle, and now she's been caught. Jesus stops and, and he looks around and then he asks his disciples a rather amusing question from the disciples' perspective. He says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, dude, Jesus. That's a loose translation of the Greek there. But they're saying, Jesus, you're in a crowd. Many people are touching you. That's what a crowd is. People bumping into you and, and that's just, what do you mean who touched you? What a ridiculous question. And Jesus ignores them, which is awesome, and just kind of keeps looking around, keeps looking around. And finally, this woman, this poor woman, who has been caught stealing a miracle, she comes forward. And notice what the text says. She's frightened. She's trembling. Why would she be frightened? Well, because she knows she's violated all the rules of her culture. She's violated all the rules. She's out in a crowd. She's out and about. She approached her religious teacher. She touched this rabbi. She is violating those rules. And she's afraid of what may happen. Maybe he'll take the miracle away. Maybe there'll be other consequences. She's afraid. She comes and she kneels before him and she pours out all of her story, what happened and, and what took place. And she just cries out for mercy. She throws herself on the mercy of the Lord Jesus. It's a really good thing to do, by the way. And she basically is just honest and, and open. And, and I love the way Jesus treats her. I love the way he speaks to her. He doesn't say woman. He doesn't say thief or scoundrel or rogue. No, he doesn't even address her with any uh, polite terms for his society of ma'am or... No, look at what he calls her, daughter, daughter. That word alone would have reassured her. That word alone said, you're not being spoken to or looked at by someone who is upset with you or angry at you or... No, this is a very different situation. So someone who respects and, and has kindness towards you is going to extend grace to you and, yes, mercy. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now, it's the power of God that's made her well. She knows that, and Jesus knows that. But he's trying to communicate to her, your faith has served as a conduit for the power of God, the, the miracle-working power to flow from the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, into her because of her faith. Her faith has served as a conduit, opening up a portal for that power to, to flow and heal her. So her faith has made her well. And he says, go in peace. But he says one more thing, right? He basically says, you get your life back. You get your life back. You have been made well. You are restored. You are, in this situation, free. You are able to restore and return to normal life. Now, that's important because he uh, has called her out. She could have walked away. She could have just faded in the crowd. Jesus didn't need to do this. So why does he do this? Why does he confront and cause this woman uh, to come forward with such fear and anxiety and have this encounter with him? Why does Jesus do that? Well, there's a purpose behind it. It's a greater purpose than even for the woman. Jesus knows what she needs. She thought she just needed a miracle, but Jesus knows she needs more than that. Yes, she needs the miracle, the healing, but she needs her life back. She needs a public declaration that she is well, a public declaration that she is free from this issue of 12 years. So he publicly, for her benefit and all those listening, 
says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You are set free from this. You are healed, essentially. So he's publicly giving her the recognition of the healing and that this is no longer going to be a problem of being unclean or socially outcast or any of that. That's all gone. He's declaring her to be free from all of that. He's giving her her life back. And he's reassuring her, you did nothing wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't steal a miracle. No, that's your perception. That's not a correct view, though. He's addressing all of that. If she had just walked away and faded into the crowd without this encounter, she may have lived the rest of her life uh, thinking that she had done something wrong. But Jesus is wanting her to be free from that. No shame. No shame. No blame. No accusations. No even self-condemnation. No. You're free. You are free. Your faith has made you well. So what we would view as an interruption, Jesus views as a divine appointment, and he handles this woman with grace, with mercy, with love, with kindness. Brothers and sisters, may we do the same. As you walk through the crowds of your day, as you walk through your schedules and your to-do lists and your busy, busy moments, understand that God may set some divine appointments for you. Be open to that. Have a people-centered uh, attitude. Go through your day looking for the opportunities that God may put in your path. Those people, those situations, maybe just brief encounters where God may want to work through you to extend grace to someone who needs a bit of care, mercy, grace, and love. So brothers and sisters, as we continue on together, continue to be word wise, continue to apply the word of God as you learn the word of God. And thanks for joining us today.